Olá, boa tarde. É... Muito bem-vindos a todos. Obrigado por estarem aqui. É... Esse é um, essa é uma oportunidade realmente única, muito especial para todo mundo que se interessa por direito internacional, especialmente, mas também por é, teoria do direito e história do direito. É, e essa vinda do Marte Koskinemi, que logo eu apresentarei para vocês em poucas palavras, em português, é possível, graças ao esforço e ao convite do professor Alberto Amaral, que é nosso colega, amigo, professor aqui da Universidade de São Paulo, é, e do centro que ele dirige, que é o Centro de Direito e Relações Internacionais, que é o Orbis, e em parceria com o nosso Centro de Direito Global, aqui da Escola de Direito GV de São Paulo, que é coordenado por mim, que congrega aqui dentro da escola todos os esforços relativos ao direito internacional. Então, o professor Alberto o Orbes aceitaram, junto conosco, organizar essa vinda do professor Marte Koskenemi. É, a estrutura dos trabalhos será basicamente uma fala de uns 40, 45 minutos pelo professor Koskenemi, depois alguns comentários dos que estão aqui à mesa, o professor Alberto, a Fábia, eu mesmo. E aí nós vamos abrir para é, perguntas e reações do, do professor Koskinemi. É, Marte Koskinemi, é assim, o, o bom de, de receber um convidado muito conhecido é que nós podemos ser econômicos na apresentação sem sermos uh, ofensivos. É, é, é um dos maiores nomes hoje do direito internacional, é um uh, dos escritores mais influentes nessa área. Ele faz questão de jogar um olhar sempre muito crítico e muito penetrante para o direito internacional e para os vários capítulos do direito internacional. Tem trabalhado com algumas questões centrais dessa área. É, tem feito um grande esforço no que diz respeito a, a traçar a história do direito internacional mas trabalhou algumas das questões teóricas mais importantes, como, por exemplo, o tema da fragmentação do direito internacional, da relação entre os regimes do direito internacional. E, para isso, ele realmente se serve de uma inteligência muito penetrante. Vocês verão isto quando forem se familiarizando com seus textos e também de uma experiência muito longa como membro da Comissão de Direito Internacional, mas, antes disso, também como membro do Corpo Diplomático da Finlândia, que é seu país de origem. Então, sem muito mais do que isso, acho que já basta. Eu vou passar a palavra ao professor Marti Koskinen. Please. Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction, of which I understood about 10%, but I'm sure that that you've been uh, duly warned about what's going to come. I have to apologize first for my informal dress here. It's really for somebody coming from where the polar bears um, o operate. You know, it's very warm, so I apologize for that. I also, I want to thank for this very kind invitation for me, uh, Dean, Oscar, Salem, to be here. I really feel privileged uh, to be talking to you on 10 things you didn't know about human rights, or they didn't, maybe you knew them, but they didn't tell you. Um, and uh, I see many people in the audience that I've seen in the course of these four days. For you who've been following my course, I have to apologize because I'm going to impose some stuff that you know already so well. And, um, but there are others, perhaps, who might still be able to benefit from bits and pieces. Um, so, I was invited to um, speak on a critical approach to human rights, and I thought, well, 45 minutes, what can one do? Maybe one can just say 10 things in 45 minutes, well, 10 things with three or four paragraphs joining each. Um, and let me start. So the first thing, Human rights did not always exist. There is this language, of course, and a familiar ideology about uh, human rights being inalienable, universal, indivisible, and imprescriptible. It is as if they were a part of the 
human, but it is human in us, and we've always been human. So there is a more or less well-articulated sense that human rights have been here always. Now, I have to reveal that the uh, dreadful fact that actually that's not the case. There is recently a lot of historical work, increasing amount of historical work on human rights, which situate the beginning of human rights in different places. Some say, oh, well, the Roman law. Roman lawyers knew about subjective rights. Others say, no, no, canon lawyers have a good claim. The idea of subjective rights was developed as part of the, develop, uh, the development of Roman law and later on of the, uh, the Thomistic uh, developments um, in scholasticism of a, an idea of subjective rights that was uh, important. Some point to the Spanish scholastics, uh, Vittoria, uh, uh, Domingo de Soto, and others. And it's true, and as I've been speaking to uh, friends uh, during these days, they do have a notion of, um, or that resembles human rights. Others point, those who are more inclined to like Protestants, they uh, point to Hugo Grotius, and it's true that there is a very robust sense of right as a quality or a faculty of an individual, etc. Very recently, uh, a colleague and a friend from Columbia Law School, Sam Moyne, published a book on the last utopia, where he argues that human rights emerged in the 1970s, and I'm more or less in that boat. So let me tell you how human rights arose. And let me first shock you, they didn't fall out of the sky one morning when you opened the window and you looked, it had rained. No, they don't come about like mushrooms. Uh, they, they have a social history. And the social history is about the internal development of modern law, Western law, about the rule of law. In the late 19th century, early 20th century, many uh, European industrial states, of course, by the way, these are always European stories. Every story I tell is a European story. Um, and I come back to whether that's problematic or not. Um, so uh, in, inside the rule of law uh, ideology, there was the sense that society should be ruled by reference to general rules that applied equally to everyone that had a general formulation in legislation and that, were, that was able to predetermine our actions also in the future so that individuals could plan their action. You should know the, whether the legal system reacts. You needed rules for all those reasons. Nevertheless, a familiar development in modern societies was their fragmentation, the sense that society no longer was uniform in the way that it was in the early parts of the 19th century. Some people went to cities, some stayed in the countryside, in the cities, some made shoes, others owned factories that made those shoes, others gave loans to factory makers who, uh, or, um, who then contributed to the industry. The, the lives of these people were very different. Society, this is just a standard story about modernity, about fragmentation, about loss of control, loss of the center. Max Weber, among other lawyers, um, uh, then noticed the phenomenon that in such a situation, a situation of increasing complexity, general rules no longer did the work which they were expected to do. No, they were, became rather the problem. The general rules generalized too much. It was now complex. You had to fit the government or the decision of the administrator to the particularities of the situation. Max Weber noted this was the deformalization of modern law. And standards such as reasonableness, good faith, uh, flexible standards emerged that allowed the uh, administrator to look at the context and develop a decision or a specific rule that corresponded to the needs of the situation. And thus it was until the 70s or so. Uh, and until the moment where we noticed that, well, actually, that's very problematic. Because what happens with deformalization is that decision-making powers, this is all very familiar, decision-making powers is, are given away from the legislator who legislates, to the one who applies the rule, who says what's reasonable in a particular situation, who determines what's in accordance with good faith here. Um, and that's problematic. You, didn't, you wanted to get away from the situation with the rule of law, where administrators, judges, 
by reference to what they happen to think, think was the just reasonable solution in a case where exercising power upon you. The rule of law, the point of the rule of law was precisely to bind the hand of, hands of those people. Complexifi complexification, deformalization freed the hands of those people. And so you needed something new. You needed to be able to say that whether or not this or that solution might, in view of a municipal administrator or a, or a judge in a city court or somewhere, to be in accordance with the general interest of the society or overall equitable in an econ after an economic calculation, that this would be the optimal result um, that you would, have to, you would have to be able to say, well, no, no, even if it's optimal, no. Imagine your parents, the old parents living in an old parent's house. Um, the calculation is being made that the, um, an industrial plant would be better produce welfare for the people in the municipality. And so you interpret the municipality uh, regulations so that actually uh, we need to move the old people's house 200 kilometers back into the rainforest um, and situate the plant there. You needed to have something to say to the administrator. So you needed to say the old people have a right to say, stay where they are. Some hard, tough argument. And so that's what human rights started to promise you. Sometime in the 1970s. In some time in the 1970s, around 1978 or so, Professors of law, I wasn't a professor of law, I was in a respectable discipline at the time, namely I was a diplomat. But professors of law, I hear, received on their table an American book called Taking Rights Seriously, which made precisely this kind of a point that ruling society is not just going by whatever some administrator might think is in accordance with some political principle or some idea of reasonableness. No, we, we have a right. We have to take those rights seriously. So that's where the rights emerge. So they didn't always exist. They are a product of a specific internal development in law, which again is the reflection of a very specific social uh, set of experiences. So now you know where they came from. We don't know yet where they go, but we'll see. As a result, human rights are everywhere. Human rights are everywhere. and. Therefore, they are not really anywhere. One result of the powerful entry of rights in uh, late modern society was that everybody began to translate their particular preferences in the language of rights. Because now we've seen that right emerged as a very powerful tool with which you could oppose administrators. It had an absoluteness and a hardness about it that everybody, I mean, every politically suave actor realized that if he or she would be able, in order for him or her to be able to put their preferences forward in as powerful a form as possible, then it needed to be translated into rights, into rights language. Of course, we are lawyers, no problem. We translate, you bring us our preferences, we write them into the language of rights. And very soon outside places such as, for instance, I'm sure, uh, well, for the Finnish parliament, but I'm sure their local parliament here, the municipality, etc. There were all these demonstrators, you know, 170 different citizen groups which were demanding rights, different kinds of rights. Uh, rights of housing, rights of social welfare, rights for good education, rights, right of freedom of speech, etc., etc., etc. So it would seem at that situation very important it would seem very important that we had a litmus test. That you come here, you say that's a right, I examine and I'll tell you whether it is a real right or not. Well, we don't really have it, but it's worse than that. We don't really want to have it. Why? Well, because in that case, we would no longer be ruled by a society of rights. We would be ruled by the super criterion that allows some things to exist as rights and this allows others from having that remarkable uh, quality. So there, to fight what human rights activists feel is a grave problem of proliferation, we were, in a sense, incapacitated to do anything. We could just see this thing proliferate 
in every nook and cranny. And if we said, no, no, this is just a preference of yours, it's not a right, we had no good answer to say to that person, why are you saying that? You're constantly translating your preferences into rights. What kind of uh, language is this? Where do you get this criterion? And then you say, OK, so let's have the parliament decide what are the rights. Well, that's a good solution, apart from the fact that it has two problems. One problem is that you wanted to, to have rights in order to get rid of political discretion. You know? But now if you give the parliament the right to decide which preferences are rights, then of course in the first place they are no longer inalienable, uh, they are no longer universal, they are what the parliamentary polit uh, parties come up with as whose, the, whose preferences or the preferences of which particular constituency should today be recognized as uh, so-called rights. So you, the solution of going by the way of parliament that doesn't, doesn't really work in this sense. Of course, we had to do it, because what else could we do in a reasonably respectable society than having politicians decide these things? Um, but politicians change, so change rights. That's just the mundane fact. It's precisely the mundane fact that we were so afraid of when we reacted to modernity by discovering this um, miracle that has always existed, that's imprescriptible, immovable, uh, and so on. The second big issue with this situation that arose was that, well, when rights then are everywhere, more or less, when rights are in many places at least, many people have been successful in translating their preferences into rights, what then happens in right application institutions? such as, for example, the European Court of Human Rights the, or the San Jose Court or the Inter-American Court of Human Rights or indeed domestic courts is that the practice becomes a practice of balancing between rights, right? So you, the, both parties have a right and the task is to balance, typically between the right of property and the right of free speech, for example, which is just a transformation, I would say, from an earlier very famili familiar political conflict that existed in the 1960s and 70s when my socialist friends were translating their preferences into economic, social and cultural rights and were saying, ha ha, you liberals, so you had civil and political rights, but we have economic, social and cultural rights, so Take that. <laughs> so you have to balance, you have to balance, and the question is, who does the balancing? Oh, even further, what is the criterion for balancing? Now, you might imagine that you have a criterion of putting civil rights and, let's say, social rights in some balance against each other. But where would that criterion become from? And more importantly, why would that criterion be independent from the political struggle between the right and the left as to whether in society we should prefer the values of individual freedom or social solidarity? Precisely the kinds of political debates from which the rule of law, the original idea, wanted to take us away from because that's politics, that's dark and dangerous and subjective. Okay, human rights are everywhere, not really than much anywhere. Third point, universality is a suspect category. So I came here saying I tell you a European story because whenever I say universal or international community or anything like that, the word dies in my mouth. And why is that? Well, what is the universal? So human rights are being presented as something that universally belong to humans. But in the course of human history, humans have been or the notion of a human being has been uh, uh, <coughs> understood in dozens of different ways. And that quality has been linked with an, any number of different normative uh, criteria. The European mindset within which Roman law, canon law, Protestantism, Catholicism, Immanuel Kant, and all this talk about human rights in their grand historical scheme of things up here has always been a European thing. And the European thing is always to imagine oneself as not really just European, but hey, universal. So you all want to be here. Kant in 1784 
in the universal history with a cosmopolitan purpose in, a, in an apparently, so the famous essay in which Kant uh, told us the way to the future, a providential view in which we will all learn from our mistakes and once, a, and once we'll join together in this global federation, as if innocently in the last paragraph Kant suspected that, well, Europe will probably lead the way. Now, I have to say, of course, coming from Europe today, and as I've been saying to my, uh, my students and my friends here, uh, it does not just seem that way. When I look at Sao Paulo, for instance, the energy, the optimism, and the progress that I, that I see from my previous visits in Brazil, I realize that, well, Kant might, might have been right in some things, but at least he wasn't right in this. Um, so universality, European, um, civilizing mission has always been a mission to turn everybody into um, Europeans. There isn't an imperial venture by the Spaniards, by the Dutch, by the French, or by the British that hasn't presented itself as a universal category. The universal may have been Catholicism and the wonderful rights of Indians to have a place in heaven after conversion. It may have been the right, the Protestant right, as in Gruhugo Grotius, to sail the world sea to, to sell Dutch goods and, uh, and buy Dutch goods, including slaves, uh, as a universal category. In um, De Jure Predai, a youthful work, an uh, advocacy work by, by Hugo Grotius, he puts forward the notion of everybody commercially engaging with everybody else as an outcome of, of God's providential will to bring us all together in this wonderful family where we exchange things and pay for those things. Never mind somebody uh, is being enslaved here. So the Catholics, the Protestants, I already mentioned Immanuel Kant, the French Revolution was always about imagining. So Abbé Sieyes, when he wrote, qu'est-ce que c'est le tiers état? What's the third estate? And he wonderfully answered, the third estate is the nation. So he universalized the position of the, uh, of the bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie is the nation. And Marx learned his lesson and asked the question, what is the working class? The working class is the universal class. OK, so that lasted while it lasted. The working class now, when I look at it, I don't know about here, but when I look at it in Finland, the working class tends to be about five people. In, uh, in a certain suburb in, uh, outside Helsinki. The working class is no longer really a serious phenomenon to, uh, to deal with. What's there that's universal then now? Well, all kinds of people suggest that. International lawyers, for instance, speak in the language of an international community, using often Latin phrases to underline the fact that, that it's both serious and incomprehensible at the same time. <laughs> These European languages are languages on which, which make a universal claim, the claim of which puts forward the idea that the one who uh, speaks that language uh, is also the ruler. The, the, uh, so the, if you're able to make your language the universal language, if you are the native language speaker of that language, well, that's great for you. So universality is a suspect category. I say nothing more at this point. Human rights helps your adversary, too. So I told this story already today to my, my students that um, during the liberation of South Africa from apartheid, the uh, African National Congress, the ANC, had a big human rights agenda. And that human rights agenda after the victory became a very robust and impressive part of the South African constitution. Now, if we look at the uh, practice of the South African Supreme Court and we ask, how has it then it applied the Bill of Rights in the South African Constitution, we realize that it's applied it mostly in order to defend the property rights of white property owners in South Africa. Because it is the case that the number of rights are unlimited, it follows quite, quite naturally, though perhaps counterintuitively, that every claim can always be 
uh, translated into a rights claim, including the claim of your adversary. For some incomprehensible reason, many of my, many of my human rights friends have very distinct, despite the universality of the language that we speak, um, have a very distinct set of preferences, political, economic, cultural preferences, and those preferences do not easily accommodate ideas such as the most important human right in any historical understanding is the right to property. And it's only when once one realizes that property is not just some right, but a historically powerful and important part of the human rights world, then one realizes that one's political struggle just may perhaps have to use uh, techniques and languages that are more complex than that provided by uh, human rights. So to say this is not to denigrate rights. We all need rights and we all fight for those rights. But to say this is that means that we should not make a commitment to rights in abstract. Because rights serve every purpose. A commitment to human rights, I shall be a human rights specialist, is meaningless in political terms. Because it also means, it doesn't only mean what people sometimes, especially my friends, think it means that good so, sort of pinkish left, slightly left preferences will be advanced. No, no. Actually, uh, it may well go the other way around. So human rights helps your adversary too. Five. Human rights violations have a context. So right foc a human rights focuses on individuals. This is banal. That's what it's intended to do, especially the liberal rights discourse that won over after the, the, the Cold War. It focuses on individuals. It looks as, at individuals as good or as bad. Uh, human rights comes together with the fight against impunity. So this is a... a, a an effort to, in a sense, is try to escape the moral neutrality and the disappointments that the rule of law in its neutral form has provided. The rule of law in its neutral form, which wasn't able to respond to the necessities of complexification, therefore it deformalized, and therefore we needed to have, have these rights. It isn't able to uh, respond to those. But and so we have very strict lined normative, uh, or we rediscover very strict lined normative rules, which we now call rights. Well, that takes us back to the initial starting point, where we had rules with definite lines that, were, that became a problem in a complex society. Deformalization, now we have new rules, equally complex lines called rights, but they are over and under inclusive in the sense that they will necessarily encompass some situations that you didn't want to them to encompass had you known of them when you enacted that rule or that right. And they don't encompass those situations that you would want them to encompass, but you didn't know about those situations when you enacted the rule. So the hum every human right includes things and excludes things, the ex inclusion or exclusion of which is a scandal. So you need to balance. You need to, have to, uh, to take into account the context in which the, the right is being exercised. So some years ago in France, a fascist uh, writer, um, uh, Jean, I suppose, Garodi, uh, wrote anti-Semitic tracts. And of course, he was fined, taken to, to uh, a court in France, and was fined. He complained to the European Court of Human Rights. And the European Court of Human Rights saw some lines on a white paper and had to think, well, whether this is or is not inside the freedom of speech of Mr. Garodi. Now, had those lines been about the, the people from, uh, let's say, southern France or people from Bretagne, I would say it's the kind of language which everybody uses from people who come from those places. The kind of language which people from Sao Paulo use about people who come from the Northeast, let's say. But this 
was a situation about anti-Semitism, about Jews. The court could only determine whether this was a violation or not by taking into account the specific history of what happened to Jews in France, the Vichy regime, the, the transportation, 76,000 uh, French Jews were uh, transported to the concentration camps, all the problems about reconciliation and thereafter. So a violation, whether this was a violation or not, had a context. I today mentioned to my students the situation of East uh, Germany during the Cold War. So many people um, cooperated with the Stasi, the secret police, and gave, giving information on, on others. Now, later on, when we assess their activity, we like to say such that, that people's rights were violated and that these were violators. But hold on. This was a vicious society where there was danger lurking all over the place. People were under pressure. What do you do? You can assess those activities only by reference to some context or other. So a thing becomes a, a, a struggle for freedom or an act of terrorism only by reference to some context. The meaning of the act isn't in the act itself. It's in the act in the theater uh, where it happens. And human rights, the vocabulary of human rights, invites us not to think about that context. It invites us to look at whether this is good or evil in some abstract sense. Why? Well, because if it doesn't, then it loses the clear lines. Then we have to start to debate such, uh, questions such as, what kind of a society was East Germany? What kind of society was Brazil during the military rule? And how do we apply today's standards against them? So do we think everybody should be a heroic resistance? We know from those situations that after the situation is over, then everybody is a heroic resistant. But, you know, it's more complicated. And human rights abstracts that complication because it invites us to have a complex discussion about political history, about the, about the human psyche, uh, and, and about um, economic situation, the personal situation, the social situation in which we've been. Human rights are about ruling humans. That is to say, about seizing power and using it to help friends and oppose adversaries. Again, I, because my, my uh, experience with human rights people often comes from students. So I, for some reason, I get more human rights activists than, the, than leave my courses. Um, but when they come to my courses, they often believe that human rights is something that is, uh, that is used against power, that it's an anti-power that it's speaking truth to power kind of a thing. Well, yeah, that's a powerful way of expressing the cultural um, uh, uh, leanings of those people who like human rights. And because they have this sense, they often participate in international or civil society organizations such as Greenpeace, Amnesty. They want to have a career in the United Nations or the, the ILO, UNHCR. They want to go to Geneva. But hold on. So they want to self-amputate themselves as efficient actors in the world. So in order to, to advance the kinds of causes which these friends of mine, students of mine, with which I agree very much, don't go to the most marginal places where there really isn't any real power. Ima remember, human rights is an effort to change the world. You can't do that if you only sit with your friends and go to see the kinds of cinema with them and have a glass of red wine. It's fun, and I applaud you for being able to do that. I have been doing that, but unfortunately, you can't change the world. So you have to go to a transnational bank. You have to go to an international company. You have to become a financial expert. That's how you can advance human rights. It's, human rights are about seizing power. You have to understand yourself as a man or a woman that longs for power in order for you to advance the kinds of things that you uh, uh, want to advance. Seven, the worst atrocities takes place in the human rights system. This is so obvious that I'm almost embarrassed uh, to, to put this forward. So human rights focuses not only but predominantly on individuals. The world, 
I, so my students from this, this week have heard this often enough. I tend to think that the world is a disaster. And that, that, but I don't believe that that disaster can be attributed to lack of attention to human rights standards. <coughs> so the world, uh, well, the situation of the world is a, is an, is a consequence of economic, political, military, various sociological <laughs> systems uh, operating on the world. Um, the human rights culture that we come to know and appreciate, the culture of San Jose, Strasbourg, etc., abstracts from all of that. These are kind-hearted men and women who don't really grapple with issues of social distribution, dislocation, the insufficient access to housing, the unequal access to education, to poverty. They may be able to say these concerns out loud, but the human rights language doesn't provide them the avenue of addressing them. And I come in my point nine. So how come it fails? So what I suggest to you that attention to the human rights system is attention away from where the pro problems of the world are today uh, created. Eight. <laughs> ah, so emancipation is not about morality. So this seems somewhat far away from, from human rights. Uh, but I suggest to you that human rights entered the Western legal systems and political systems as a call for taking the, the as an invitation to take the call of the heart seriously. Taking rights seriously is to look beyond bureaucratic practices. It's to look beyond technical managerialisms that look at people in an impersonal fashion and therefore appear to trample people underground. Therefore, we need, the heart needs to speak. The human being needs to look the other human being in the eye and see their uh, holder of a right just like, like I am. It calls a moral commitment. But emancipation is not about becoming a good person and being able to hear the other good person. Emancipation is to be able to identify those causal chains. Now remark the way I'm putting this. M those causal chains that attribute, or, or those chains that cause that some people, or create the link that some people's deprivation is always the, the causal result of other people's doing it oh so well. So there is no violation in the world that uh, at the other end of which would not be some benefit to another person. The human rights world tends to suggest that rights come together in a harmonious whole, as if it were a hidden puzzle, the pieces of which were thrown about in, in, in the world, and our task would be just to find them and to finally put them together. But it's not like that. Some people's rights can only be realized um, by depriving others. But the world's resources are limited. We can only realize something. We have to constantly make choices between resources. Uh, An uh, ideology that says to us that we have always had these rights, the only thing is that we now implement them, and that every right is equally valuable with every other right because it doesn't have a, a standard whereby it could privilege these with each other, leads us to a dead end because we need to prioritize, because it's true that we can realize somebody's rights only at the cost of some other person's right. The question of whether the balance should be on the right of freedom of the demonstrators or the right of property of those uh, property owners that are by the square where the demonstrators um, act, we should strike a balance. One person's right immediately cuts into the other person's right.
Now I tell, again, I apologize my students who've heard at least a bit of this earlier. Some years ago, my institute, the Eric Castrain Institute of International Law and Human Rights, was asked by the Finnish um, foreign minister to con conduct two um, con consultant studies. The studies are available on our website. The studies had to do with uh, human rights-based approach to development, HRBA. The Finnish Development Agency wanted to participate in the effort to make development policies more human rights friendly. And the other study was a study which we made on the integration of human rights in European Union uh, foreign and security policy. So we were asked to do how to do that in the best way. Now, there are a number of technical ways in which we can go about doing that. For instance, we can educate development experts or security and foreign policy experts, or we can send human rights experts into those missions. But in both of these studies, we came up with an identical conclusion. And it was that when the discussion was about how to advance the welfare or, or in a devel development project in Tanzania, then the development experts had to face dire choices between whether they should really advance the agricultural techniques of the villagers, whether they should provide schools for girls, whether they should provide um, police forces to provide for security, whether they should uh, give human rights training to the, to the judges, etc. And like always in these situations, the funds available were limited, now, we noticed the human rights commitment that we had, or were expected to have, gave us no tools whatsoever to resolve those conflicts. In order to be a human rights-based person, a based approach kind of a person, helping out, uh, for instance, the European Union Foreign and Security Policy Mission in Pristina, you needed to resolve questions such as whether housing or providing employment opportunities would more lead more rapidly to the integration of the Kosovar society. And of course we had people who said, everybody has a right to housing, everybody has a right to education. Well, is that helpful? No! They didn't say anything that any, everybody didn't know already. The question was how to efficiently allocate the available funds. And that required then that you actually became a development kind of a person or a security kind of a person who professionally is engaged in precisely thinking about these things. Now, this is not a recipe for successful development or a secure environment in those places, but it is a necessary starting point. And the tragedy, if you wish to put it in this way, the tragedy for my human rights friends was that they were now called upon to precisely leave aside the particular identification and the preferences and the language uh, that had produced them as experts in something in the first place. They didn't know a thing about how to organize plumbing in the kinds of housing that, that exist in Pristina. So they needed to take up new books, become economists, become administrators. And hold on, what happens now? Well, now there is a situation where they are called upon to make assessments about what's efficient, optimal, what's reasonable, what's in accordance with good faith. They are a part of the deformalized environment of governing complex modern societies in which every absolute, including a human rights absolute, is part of the problem and leads you to no solution. So I suggest to you there is no such thing as a human rights based approach to anything. There are economically efficient uh, uh, solutions to things. There, there are environmentally good and bad solutions to things. There are solutions to things that provide for security or undermine security. And this is what we need to know. The last point 10. Secular religions are worse than religious religions. So human rights, and this is a banal point, human rights is a secular religion. It's a secular religion as long as it imagines itself as not being really about power, but faith. And not being faith in people, but faith in abstractions, rules, that operate, as it were, out of the social context. There, in the sky, they have a long white beard, um, 
and come to help us in the moment of distress in the evening. We kneel by the bed and we say we shall have these rights. But, and that's, uh, that's helpful in some ways, of course, in the ways that religions are helpful. Nevertheless, I would say thinking of human rights in these terms is worse because of the, um, because of the expectations that human rights create. Religions no longer create such expectations here on earth because conveniently religions tell us that we will be saved when we are dead. So we can think about that and we can feel better and we survive in this society. But human rights has incapacitated itself from saying that. It has promised us heaven here on earth. And that, I suggest to you, is worse than a religious religion because it creates the kind of absolutism which undermines the necessity of political negotiation. Political negotiation, which is the only acceptable way in, the, in which the kinds of social conflicts and problems that human rights people articulate in terms of right, conflicts of rights can be resolved. We have to look at the preferences. We have to look at the available uh, resources and then allocate those resources, damn it. And this means always Somebody gets, another person doesn't get. This is something that human rights doesn't accept. And therefore, I suggest to you, really, it's a secular religion which is worse than a religious religion. So, with this, 10 things they don't tell you about human rights, now you know, um, and go and tell your kids. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Marty. It was uh, uh, it was very very enlightening, I think, and uh, very provocative as well. Uh, I'm sure we will we will see the effects of the provocation uh, shortly. Uh, I just wanted to uh, ask you a couple of questions, uh, make a couple of comments. And then uh, uh, let uh, Fabio speak and Professor Alberto, and then we will open for debates. My impression uh, from uh, from your talk and also from uh, some of the reading I've I've done of your uh, work is that uh, basically everything at the end is political. Pol politics is in everything, right? Uh, please tell me if I'm wrong, but. Uh, but uh, I think you, or at least uh, this is what I have understood, that you see politics in several processes, several kinds of processes. Uh, one way in which uh, uh, politics presents itself is in the legal argument itself, uh, whether it is in the process of creating norms but more specifically uh, and more intensely maybe at the moment of applying norms and, uh, and constructing discourses regarding norms. Uh, so uh, there is a political play that goes on as you try to make the norms say what you need them to say at a specific time, right? I think this uh, also applies to human rights. Uh, or may apply to human rights as uh, a chapter of law or as uh, an ensemble of norms and institutions. Uh, today it seems uh, the politics appeared more in the discourse on human rights. So uh, it is a power play uh, either between uh, hegemons and their uh, subordinated uh, actors. So for example, uh, as you said, human rights is a universal and it is a, un a European universal. And as every universal, it is a tool of imperialism, right? So there is this aspect of uh, the political in the human rights discourse that is uh, the, the way in which 
a universal idea is imposed on others, right? But on the other side, concerning still the discourse or the knowledge involving human rights, it seems that uh, human rights, when they are the object of uh, experts or those who tend to see the, the human rights as an approach, is, as you said today, devoid of power, right? So uh, if you want to really advance the cause of human rights, you have to go somewhere else, but not to the human rights institutions, right? So uh, if you want to really change uh, the condition of human rights, you have to be everything but a human rights activist, right? So I don't know if my reading is correct, but, uh, but there is always the, the power play that is underlying the discourse. Uh, and there is a final, a final place where I see the, the political element uh, in, in intertwined with law or with legal uh, discourse in your work. And uh, it's something you haven't touched upon today, but I would like to provoke you bringing it up, uh, which is the issue of uh, relationship between regimes because you also speak of uh, hegemonic regimes and uh, the relationship between regimes as being a relationship of uh, power, uh, and as well as of uh, universal and relative. Uh, uh, but <clears throat> so you say that uh, as it is the case for the sovereigns, uh, for the states, in their disputes among themselves, uh, we can see a similar process of uh, dispute between legal regimes. Uh, at least in international law, it's common, and you use the expression, there is the regime, or we think of a regime of human rights in international law. Uh, but myself, uh, as I deal with uh, the idea of regimes, and I have been trying to do so for, for uh, some time now, I see, I have a very, uh, uh, very deep uh, difficulty in identifying the borders of a regime. So when we speak and we do this uh, in general terms and with much assurance, and we feel very comfortable saying that there is a regime that is called the human rights regime and I can talk of its norms, of its institutions, and I can talk of its interaction with other regimes and, uh, and of its collision and uh, conflict with other regimes. But uh, when I try to identify exactly the borders of the regime, I find myself uh, a little bit uh, lost because, of course, we can think of it as a more or less identifiable ensemble, but uh, when it is time to decide whether this norm belongs to this regime or only to this regime, and whether this institution works only for this regime or works for this regime and for others, uh, or if a norm belongs to more than one regime at the same time. So this is just a, a provocation, is wh whether it is really possible to identify the borders of the regimes and uh, if it is important to do so. Why do I think it is more important? Because uh, yourself and, and others, when, uh, speak of re when, they, when you and others speak of regimes, uh, usually we, uh, we, do the, we identify the regimes as issue, issue specific uh, sectors of society that produce their own norms and their uh, institutions. Uh, and we admit usually that uh, the norms that uh, are part of a specific regime, specific, especially when we think of it as an issue, a specific uh, regime, the norms do not all come from public international law. Uh, they come from other sources and they are other types of norms that we call transnational regulation or domestic law, private regulation, etc. So uh, this is a, f a further reason for me to ask whether it is possible and whether it is important to identify the borders of a regime, 
Because if they are not, if all the rules and institutions are not located within one legal system that is public international law, this may bring us more uh, difficulties. Uh, but I would like you to touch upon this idea. And finally, just about the universality. You said everything you're going to say was European. Uh, and uh, I, I like very much your distinction when in your literature on human rights between common goods and individual goods. Uh, can we go a step further and think of not only the Europeans and the rest of the world, but the European or Western <coughs> representation of law uh, as opposed to other possible representations of law and therefore of human rights, specifically as you have said, uh, limited to the individual as being the owner or the holder of the absolute rights that are human rights. Uh, and I mean this seriously, but uh, let, me, let me say uh, a little bit of, on what I mean. So uh, this left, this familiar left trope of moving to the political from various things. So it doesn't, at least when I've now come to think of it, it, it doesn't mean uh, to, to indicate that there is some Piristine field over there, that room over, that that's politics. Whereas we here are lawyers and those, those people do are, are doing economics. So that's not really what is indicated, although it sounds often like that. Uh, instead, what is indicated, I think, is an appeal to more uncertainty. Not only more uncertainty, more, ex more, more experience of deciding in a situation of uncertainty. So when, the, when I say that uh, human rights uh, is incapable of deciding of, of difficult political questions, what I mean thereby is that human rights in this ideological religious mode with the, with the bright lines and, and clear, clear limits um, isn't open to the experience of uncertainty and decision. So the call for politics is to, let's remember that whatever we do, it's we who act. It's not some, some um, autonomous system of rules that acts on our behalf. If it were, you see, that I think this is the point. If it were, then we would never be responsible. It would just be, you know, I applied the law. You know, I, I just didn't grant you this because you don't have the right to it, and that's it. Go out. What are you doing here? No, I think all my work on legal indeterminacy, all the critical work about the openness of the legal system, has as its consequence the sense that when we operate within it, then we operate in a situation of undecidability. That it's fundamentally us that decide, that the system itself always brings us just five minutes from the decision, but never quite into it. Be and I've tried to theoreticize it by this, the, the binaries apology to utopia, that, uh, it, uh, apology and utopia, so that there are always two opposite solutions to every single legal problem, and that which one of them you choose is your choice. So the, the call to sensitivity to the political, to more politics, is the call to be open to that sense that it's I who decides. Because only then, also it's I who can feel responsibility for my decision. So where does that leave us in terms of the bigger questions in society about how things should be, uh, should be decided? So now, in front of all this audience, I've said, I will never ever say, let's become political. Uh, I will say, well, let's become economic. Let's become religious. Let's become technological. Let's become managers. Let's become financial experts. Let's become development experts. Because all of these systems, now mark my clearly what I'm saying, all of these systems, development, economics, physics, psychology, sociology, all these boxes, if you wish, which we are so familiar with in modern society, in the university especially, they all have this same quality of being open-ended, of being open to decision and con contestation and controversy. The one experience that I have so about interdisciplinary work is this, that 
during the day when we have the interdisciplinary conference, you know, we are completely incomprehending, not comprehending each other and hating each other and undermining each other and exercising power over each other, lawyers, economists, psychologists, uh, international relations people, etc. But in the evening, in the evening, after the conference is ended, we go to the bar, we have, you know, three, di tr three drinks or let's say two drinks too many, and then we start to decide in, in that sense. And, and then at some point in the evening, the economist confesses that, listen, Marty, we are just completely confused. We don't know. <laughs> and we have these opposite theories and the best economists, and they are just completely. And, and she will tell you that actually, I believe that it's all about the human psyche, about the how, how human psychology moves. Okay, so the next conference with psychologists and your, the lines, borders between you and the psychologists very thick, you know, you struggle against them. Uh, and then in the evening, the drinks, and then the conversation, you know, Marty, psychology is really in a mess today. <laughs> and so it continues. So there is this uh, sense that the crisis of modern reason, if you wish, to put it in a fine philosophical way, is not just a crisis of law. <sighs> so if we are not the only ones. So every discipline has experiences the same. So the, the deeper you sink into the discipline, the more formidable uh, heroes of the discipline you meet, the more clear it becomes that they are completely undecided about the basis of the discipline itself, which is great which is what academic life should be, which means that there is no system in which the world's problems would have been, as it were, already resolved, so that the only thing would be just, you know, dig deep enough to get that solution which already is there. No, the solution is about human choice. And so I want to, if I still may use once the word politicization, I want to politicize these fields as they are, not as them being something that they are not, but to feed into this embedded sense in experts that, the, that, okay, so you're insecure, so am I. Everybody is. Let's think about this. And let's, we have to still decide because there's lots of problems, but we are un uncertain about that. If everybody, so if I hear eco an economist on TV to make that point so clearly, I think, yes, so the politicization project has, has finally won a victory. It's no more complicated than that. It's to feed into the sense of powerful men and women that they too don't really know, but that they do have to decide and that the decision in some relevant sense lies upon their shoulders and not in some logic that their expertise has produced uh, for them. That also begins to answer the question about regimes. What do I think of regimes? And the question of boundaries of regimes. Now, I don't think, I don't think that regimes are boxes out there into which you, we could look, open them, close them, etc. I think all of these expert things that in, uh, so environmental law, typically environmental law, human rights law, humanitarian law, investment law, um, the security law, uh, hum uh, humanitarian, uh, all of these different boxes, they are projections of language. They aren't something that's out there, it's something that's in here. And we become educated, so my friend David Kennedy always says, um, a man with a hammer sees every problem as a nail. And you can see the point, so you are an economic expert, you walk in, the, in Sao, Sao Paulo and you see economic problems all over the place. You are a plumbing expert, you walk around in Sao Paulo, you see plumbing problems everywhere. You are a civil rights lawyer, you walk around in Sao Paulo and, yeah, well, you know how it continues. So the regime, and so you ask, well, is there a, a strict line? So are the problems of Sao Paulo really economic problems? Or are they real? No, but that's a nonsense question because the definition of the problem is not um, about the description of the problem, it's about what kind of expertise you a priori want to engage in order to analyze why do people in Sao Paulo feel bad, for instance, if they do. I, I should have used Helsinki as an example. <laughs> uh, so uh, it, from this perspective, to, what is it then to identify a regime? 
No, it's just to identify an expert language that somebody uses, a language with some apparent power. And then you, when you hear the language, you hear the, who speaks it also. So what sort of a person is that? We are all complicated people. We don't have clear boundaries. So and I look in the mirror in the morning, and especially in a, in a jet lagged situation. So who is this person? And I can't believe I'm that old, and et cetera. So, um, Human life is very complicated, and the Western idea of rationalization, where we do need those boxes, is a useful tool sometimes. But sometimes it's really more the problem uh, than the solution. So, um, Salim, you asked a question about belonging. What is it to belong to a regime? To belong to a regime is to be classified by some re representative of a regime as part of that regime, part of the problem, for instance. Um, so that's it. And how do be people become experts? Well, we choose them. So my, I have this conversation with my daughter. She, she started out by going to the economic school at Helsinki, uh, did a, a, a small degree in economics, but said she hated it, too much math. So she, she had thought she would be a banker because, of course, she had heard my lect lecturing on dinner table often enough. And she is a woman who wants to seize power. Uh, but she, doesn't, she no longer thinks that economics is the power, and now she is reimagining herself as an advertising critique kind of a person, which I think, well, that's very fascinating. I have no idea what the kind of profession could be, but it sounds that the kinds of, the kinds of readings and the kinds of friendships she's able to make there seem you know, nicer than in the economic field. Maybe, you know, at the end of the day, I don't know. So it's, it's life that's out there, human beings grasping in the dark, you know, trying to use this language, that language, uh, and everything is very insecure. Uh, then the last question was about Western law and the idea of individual and collective goods, for instance, a typical um, opposition in, uh, in uh, discussions about governance and, and global governance. And then there's a sense often, and my feminist friends always put this to me, that you know, the kinds of legal argument, tough legal arguments that you make that they are individu individualistically inclined, that they do not take into account the, the pre-legal solidarities and the communal feelings that exist there outside, and that's true. But I tell, tell them that, look here, that your feminism is also a part of my culture, that my culture isn't just one thing. It's always one thing and the other thing too. My culture does have, uh, as a, no, I, I speak as a Western lawyer, that was the question. As a Western lawyer, my culture does have always a mainstream of something. But it always has the critique of the mainstream as well. That's what he has learned. And therefore, it's pretty damn hard to get rid of it. Because it always says, this is the, the, the great dilemma of liberalism, the, the spider's web aspect of the kind of modernity in which we are. That the modernity presents itself always as something as well as the critique of that something. The, um, that is a, a difficult situation for the proponents of modern life because it commits them to a position of cynicism towards their own deep, most deeply felt ideas about the world, their own profession, uh, because they already know the critique of the profession. And you find that cynicism then in the evening after conference, after the third drink, too many, you find that the, it comes out. Oh, I'm so unhappy. I really don't like my colleagues. I don't like this. I think what we are engaged with is a failure or worse. Um, so, yeah, so that is a risk in this modern Western way of life that I represent. But it doesn't necessarily have to be a cynical um, a predisposition that emerges from this consciousness of the critique of what one has to say. It can also be a consciousness of the openness of that Western world. That actually maybe there is no Western world there out there. That maybe actually there are just sort of streams of ideas, histories, narrative stories about what was in the past, criticisms and very fixed positions that keep moving. And now we are, that's closer to my sense of of where we are. I started out by making a contrast 
uh, between Sao Paulo and Helsinki, uh, the, uh, Brazil and Helsinki. And I, of course, feel that contrast very much when I walk here in the street. And the contrast, as I've been putting forward, isn't favorable for my, where I come from. But on the other hand, I also feel that, well, it isn't that different. That actually, Europe or Latin America, North or South, there are many, many things that are the same. This doesn't lead me, however, to saying, well, I've grasped it now, so I am the preacher of the universal. No, I, I am more insecure than that. But so as a response to the question about individual uh, preferences and common, common good, it's true that in Western institutions, individualism for a long time has had a kind of a preference thing. But the solidarity thing has always been there as well. And the choice is, we now know, open. So we can go either way. And then there's the further uh, problem that we have to face when we've gone either way. To be an individualist or to be a solidarity kind of person very often still doesn't tell us what to do. There are as many individuals as there are, as many individualism as individuals. So you always have to interpret this by reference to the situation. And there's always the dark gap in which the decision still has to be on us. Let me uh, thank Professor Salin and Alberto for this opportunity. And of course, let me expressly say that it's a privilege to have you among us, Martin. I think we are going to miss this week of fruitful and intense debate. So, um, well, I have the challenge to say something interesting after this talk. I think I have a little chance, but anyway, I will try. Um, I would like to start um, commenting on something that we can see on the streets of, of Sao Paulo now, um, some pictures. Um, this, uh, these are related to this popular uh, group movement. They are, uh, this group of people, they are placing posters um, in the streets of Sao Paulo, trying to, to call the attention of the neighbors and, to, and the attention of everyone else um, regarding um, our past, of, um, our violent past and the human rights violations that have occurred under military rules. So they want to say that are, there, are, there is a torture uh, living next door and they also want to, to make this clear to everyone that uh, is walking in the streets. So, um, oops, where is this? Okay. It's possible also to see uh, the faces of the victims. There is a small story telling what this man used to be. He was tortured by Omero, the one that is living next door. And they are trying to call our, our attention. Uh, the importance, to, they are claiming the rights to truth and justice for the victims of this human rights uh, violation. So until now we have impunity. Omero is living in his, in his home full of uh, tranquility retire uh, as a uh, retired person well uh, so we have these things going on now a contextual experience um, considering this is hard not to think about the inter-american decisions on, on amnesty laws uh, brazil was held responsible by the inter-american court because of our, our amnesty law the same thing occurred to peru chile and uruguay so the court just stated pretty uh, clearly amnesty laws lack legal effects and, uh, under international law and we should investigate and punish and prosecute those involved in human rights uh, violations committed during dictatorships in latin america well this was the topic of my phd res uh, research and i just cannot agree with the court that amnesties are bad per se that we must hold trials for all of those uh, violations. This is because the way the court uh, justifies its uh, position uh, using a, a universalist discourse to cover its own preference for holding trials, as I think it's not possible to deduce a duty to punish an international, an objective duty to punish uh, in, interna in international law today. So I try to develop this critical position and we were walking around Sao Paulo and when I saw this, these posters I said, well I think they are important, I think they, have, they are 
it's a powerful discourse that they are developing. They are saying, we want justice, we, want, we have the right to know the truth, we have the right to know what was happening. People have to know that there is a torture uh, living here. But uh, I don't think I would be able to, um, to, to join this group or uh, anything. Uh, if they could know about this thesis, I have seen many ugly faces. Are you crazy? How can you be able to criticize such a beautiful thing that is being done by the Inter-American Court? Well, um, but after this, this critique, I, I have to say, I was not left in the dark without anything in my hands. So everything is destroyed. Human rights is something that um, can, has, uh, they, they have many dark sides and we have seen 10 interesting points with uh, Marty's talk. Um, but I think we have now, uh, if we can really go on, on on the critique and try to understand uh, that there is no, no such absolute rights like a duty to punish that we have to prosecute these people. We have an amazing opportunity to debate and to think about our violent past. Uh, we have an, an amazing opportunity to, to think about what were the choices that were made, what was put in the dark and what was put in the bright side in our Brazilian solution uh, of transitional justice. This doesn't mean that we cannot discuss, uh, of course we, we ha have this brilliant opportunity to discuss this, even with the critique, something that um, the absolutist position of the Inter-American Court just cannot allow us to go on on this responsible and conscious debate about our, our past. It would be nice to have the court in this conversation too, and I'm sure they just don't want to have this kind of conversation. The court just wants to present or to impose a, a ready-made solution to, to Latin America regarding transitional justice. Well, all these brief comments, just to um, ask you, Marty, we have seen um, many complicated aspects of the human rights discourse, but I, I would like to, to ask you uh, a few comments on your uh, text, Human Rights, Politics and Love, when you have, um, I think, we are not left in the dark with the critique. We can have, uh, human rights are still a powerful discourse, and I would, I would just like to uh, ask you for your comments, and I will quote a small passage here. Um, it's in the beginning of, of this text, Human Rights, Politics and Love. In order to reconceive the emancipatory ethos of rights, it's necessary to grasp their open-endedness, their irreducibly, uh, irreducibly political nature, the way they lead into a dialectic be between universalism and particularism, individualism and community, and perhaps, like love, sometimes make the two seem the same, if only for a moment. So, uh, even with the critique, we can somehow um, use this discourse of human rights, assuming our political presuppositions, and uh, being aware that we may not be able to have everything or to transform the world, but at least it's, it's still a, a discourse that may be able to achieve anything. Well, I absolutely am a human rights lawyer. So, and I absolutely think uh, human rights uh, are a useful tool in particular situations of political contestation. This is in part a, a sociological observation that people who carry my left preferences tend to speak the language of human rights and I would want to join with them. And sometimes they are powerful or strategically suave in a ways that they can produce stuff. So uh, I would engage with them. There's also a lot of nostalgia about human rights, where they came from and the kind of absolutism that, they, that I just attacked which speaks to one heart of, of I think everybody's one part of I, I think everybody's heart. Uh, you can't take it quite seriously, but you can at least try to use that part in order to advance what you and your friends think as important. Sociologically speaking, it's some people who speak more human rights than others. They could speak equally well Arabic or some other language, and you would sociologically be able to relate with them. You have a common project with them. Okay, so let's advance this 
human rights project. But then there are moments when that language itself, say Arabic or Finnish, is an easier, much easier example, when just joining in with the Finns just doesn't get you anywhere because you happen to be in Brazil. And so you need to talk another language. So, for instance, if when you make claims to the WTO, to take a random example, if you make claims in the WTO, you can make those claims in a human rights language, and they are pretty predictable, and they, the WTO people have their own language to put forward to you, and the contestation is stalled, where it always was. But now, if you make economic points uh, to the WTO, you t take another language, you dress up and put a tie, and, and go to Geneva, not stay outside and demonstrate outside the Rapport Centre, but you know, participate in a meeting and make sophisticated points there. Well, I think that's more useful very often. But my problem, if I can call it that, with human rights is that, that it seems to call on an unthinking commitment to human rights as a culture or a strategy or a language, which me seems, me seems to be about as important, as wise as commitment to the Finnish culture or Finnish language. Good and bad things can be attained, and it sure is a very limited culture and language. This is not, not to denigrate human rights, I want to underline. But human rights helps my adversary. But human rights have limits. And uh, when you speak human rights, some people will listen, but others won't. And you and I, as an activist, as a writer, have to think about who it is that we write for. Who is it that we want to be heard? Want to uh, to hear us, and above all, who is it that we want to persuade? People become persuaded only when, when you speak their language. If I tried to speak Finnish here, none of you would be persuaded. You would think, ajattelisitte silloin, että mitä tuo hullu tuossa oikein höpöttää. Say, that is to say, you would think, what's this guy doing here? You can make such mistakes through human rights like with any other professional language. You have to speak to persuade if you want to get things done. And persuasion means that the, those who are in a powerful position understand you and are, uh, agree with your position in the end. And so I'm afraid, Fabia, you can't get much more out of me. <laughs> First of all, I wanted to exteriorize my grand satisfaction in coming back into Getúlio Vargas Foundation. It is a great a pleasure to be here with so darling friends. Uh, I will try to discuss the topic, a critical approach to human rights from a bit different angle. I will not uh, properly uh, pose specific questions for Marty, uh, unlike uh, Salim and Fabia, but I will try to reflect about some issues that, in my view, are very significant to understand the contemporary international society. And uh, I don't have uh, time enough to debate uh, point to point raised by Marty. But uh, I will um, attempt to focus on some uh, specific uh, topics that, in my view, present what uh, is my uh, standpoint about uh, this subject. In uh, uh, some themes, I agree with Mart. In others, I have some divergence. Uh, I will uh, analyze a critical approach to human rights, therefore, uh, in two different moments. The first moment, I will present the meaning that human rights have for international relations, basically after 1945, when we have witnessed the process of dissemination and universalization of human rights. And at the second moment, 
uh, I will concentrate my attention on some limits that human rights undeniably uh, testify now. First, I shall consider that human rights have changed profoundly the normative structure of international society. And human rights have changed the normative structure of human of international society, at least in two different ways. First, human rights are held to apply with a commitment to universality. Uh, second, the role played by United Nations <coughs> has been essential, even though we regard that in many situations, United Nations have dramatically failed in protecting human rights. But we may not contest the fact that the United Nations uh, have played an important role in protecting human rights after the Second War and uh, principally in helping to build a human rights system. This fact represents a change in the structure of international society because the process of dissemination, positivation, and universalization of human rights since 1948, I think that uh, uh, the Human Rights Declaration represents the first historical consensus around a set of values that shall guide human beings everywhere. I acknowledge that this consensus was fragile at the very beginning because uh, around 50 states participated originally uh, in signing the Human Rights Declaration. But the final act of the uh, Vienna uh, meeting in 1993 reasserted the commitment to human rights by a great number of countries, the majority of the world. And the importance of this process lies precisely in the fact that the universalization of human rights transformed the relationship between rulers and ruled within the country. And this is a civilizational conquest in my point of view, because never before uh, something similar had been intended. And the second point to be stressed is that human rights uh, marks a shift in the culture of uh, human rights protection at universal level. Because uh, until 1945 and up to 1948, we uh, had international uh, rights uh, restrictively understood at uh, some specific cases. For example, the protection of foreigners. And uh, basically, human rights were limited to domestic affairs of each state. But when the UN uh, charter and after the 1948 Human Rights Declaration and the 1966 covenants uh, defined uh, a new uh, important and fundamental moment because 
they inaugurated a new culture, a new inclusive morality, a new vocabulary, and this new whole of rights uh, allowed to citizens uh, to act against their own states, empowered groups of men, uh, permitted the socialization of rights, and uh, attempted to restrict justifications for not respecting human rights. And the third important point to be highlighted uh, concerns the fact that human rights is a manifestation against human brutality. I regard that uh, Carlos Santiago Nino, uh, an important uh, Argentine philosopher, uh, reproduced it very lucidly when he asserted that uh, human, human rights uphold human dignity against the persistent human brutality. Uh, human rights is this a cry against human suffering. These three points are very significant to remote international society in the second half of the 20th century and at the beginning of the 21st century. But in spite of this, it's indispensable to look at the present reality and to understand the reasons that limit the application of human rights in some points that represent undeniably uh, questions um, which brings forth or bring forth tensions in human rights application. And the first issue uh, to be mentioned is that of limits of human rights. Human rights agenda today don't have a clear cut limit. That is, we speak of human rights uh, encompassing uh, the right of freedom, economic, social, and cultural rights, the right to a clean environment, and, and so on. But we don't delimit clearly uh, the field of application that this expression uh, shall have. And this is a point of tension because you may uh, make everything as deserving uh, protection uh, deserved by human rights conventions. And you may also trivialize human rights. And you may also become human rights a matter of uh, something without any importance. Uh, the second point of tension is that uh, human rights shall uh, allow for people a space for embodying and expressing their specificity, cultural as well as moral and religion specificity. And uh, this is essential because human rights may not be a way of imposing some questions, some preferences born in Western countries to citizens uh, wherever 
they live. It's necessary to preserve a space for cultural specificity and for moral and religious beliefs. And it is uh, uh, also uh, necessary to recognize that, on the one hand, human rights mechanisms developed after the Second World War granted to uh, human rights international bodies the power to supervise international decisions. But this power may not be beyond some limits. Because the problem that uh, Fabian uh, referred a little minutes ago, uh, because if uh, this power is uh, surpassed, we run the risk uh, that representation, accountability, and democracy may be subverted domestically. And the third point of tension uh, is uh, the situation in which we live a true dilemma. Either uh, to um, struggle for implementing human rights immediately or to engage in the construction of regimes and this may take long time. Uh, there is a trend in international society mainly on the part of human rights groups to press governments and uh, international uh, mechanisms charged with supervising the respect for human rights uh, to force countries to respect human rights immediately. And this may erode the respect for human rights and the confidence of states in international regimes for protecting human rights. Another point of tension uh, is the other relevant situation. On the one hand, we have seen the expansion, the universalization, and the dissemination of human rights internationally. But on the other hand, the internalization of human rights is a fragile process. The internaliz internalization of human rights may fail before some circumstances. For example, I raised the question of the war against the terrorism. The war against terrorism has many faces. It has one face uh, referring to the protection of the victims. It has a second face uh, related to the protection of those accused of committing terrorist acts, but it has another face. The progressive, the gradual erosion of uh, domestic commitments to human rights norms. Those are, therefore, points of tension, and there are uh, Moreover, other points of tension, for example, uh, the tension involving humanitarian crisis and uh, the possibility of intervening using force in those humanitarian crises. This is a point of tension uh, because 
the international uh, intervention in favor of human rights may be uh, more violent, more harmful than the problems and the damages domestically caused by internal violence. And we are uh, now uh, living a period of ambiguities. Uh, a period of ambiguities because uh, on the one side we may um, witness a great uh, evolution as far as concerns the existence of some values shared universally. But this is a, also a point of ambiguity because uh, the definition of the content of these values uh, is not consensually defined. Uh, Professor Koskianiani affirmed at the beginning of his explanation that human rights derives from a deformalization of law uh, in modern times, quoting uh, Max Weber. And uh, I would tell that human rights uh, is a product of deformalization of uh, modern law, but it is a product of two conjugated process. The process of formalization, because the modern law, unlike the previous uh, forms of law is essentially rational according to Weber. But this form of law lives with contradictions, with a growing materialized law. And we uh, may verify uh, this double process when we contemplate the human rights of first and second generation, if you want to uh, borrow a famous phrase commonly used. And uh, I will finish uh, recalling uh, famous uh, Charles Dickens' count of two cities. We live in the best and the worst of times. We live in a spring of hope and a winter of despair. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Elaine Silva. I appreciated very much the, your presentation and I thank all the organizers for the opportunity to be here. There, there, are, and there aren't many critical internationalists and that's one of the reasons why I think your work is so interesting to read uh, you have many of the aspects one can hope or wait for an, a critical approach. And the title of your presentation is the main, one of the main reasons that attract me here today. I could be at the other events in this week, but I chose this specific um, event because I want to know what is your critical approach? What is your concept of law in a society? And along the presentation, yeah, we saw elements, we had the historical context that reminds us of Marx. You quoted Weber, you talk about emancipation, remind us of Adorno and Horkheimer. We even had a reference to love, remind us of Honet. But as of the moment when you define the role of law, and I quote, you say that it is to how efficiently allocate available resources. This is a systemic definition as an division between system and life world. And I, I really, I'm really curious to think how you make such approach consistent with a critical approach. I'm not referring a, a human rights approach, but a critical approach to law and society. Because if you define law in economical terms, there is no room left for other approach to 
make room in the dialogue. Thank you very much. Well, uh, I'm really glad you asked me that question so that I can once and for all dispel the idea that I am here to propose a, a definition of law as to a process of how to efficiently allocate resources. So my students from this week know that for me law is a language. It's a, pro it's a professional language through which people uh, want to persuade audiences. And um, I've written hundreds of pages on how that takes place and, and how good lawyers are very skillful in changing their vocabularies in respect of the audience. So when you, when you plead in front of the appellate body of the WTO, you plead differently than when you plead in front of the Strasbourg Court of Human Rights, uh, etc. cetera. Um, I, I do think that, that the most important questions in society, ha many, let me put it this way, many of the most important questions in society have to do with the unequal distribution of resources in society now. I think myself, for myself and for my political friends, uh, we, so we see uh, inequality as a big problem. So from this perspective, I call upon my colleagues and, and hope myself to be able to contribute to a, a, a more acceptable allocation of resources in society. So I, I sort of slip into that vocabulary. But I am, so I am a romantic, and I think economics leads you nowhere. Uh, and I think matter, commitments are matter of the heart. And that uh, how, what is the right thing to go about a situation cannot be produced by an economic calculation. Uh, I don't think we have criteria for finding out what is an efficient allocation of resources. I think part of our problems uh, links to the kind of absolutism, par parallel to human rights absolutism, though differently inclined politically, which economics tends to put forward. I am confronted with having sufficient amount of evenings after a sufficient amount of drinks with my economic friends to realize that they are as insecure uh, about their choices as I am about mine. So I call upon them, so does your heart speak? And they sometimes, they say yes. Well, what is, how does it feel, what's right? So let's talk together. This, uh, so it's a complex society in which we need many kinds of languages. The languages come with, so the languages uh, uh, throw, so this is from Paul de Man, but, uh, but it's a useful expression. So uh, th that, uh, um, uh, any, any language uh, is a mechanism of insight, but also a mechanism of blindness. So the economic language of efficient allocation of resources is, an, is a language of insight. But it also leaves a number of things in the dark, like such, for instance, what, what sort of efficiency are you dealing with, who are the subjects that you take into account, et cetera, et cetera. So we need to come together because it's a complex society with economists, psychologists, sociologists, development experts, et cetera, to try to resolve these problems. Now, when I, and when I, I realize that when I say all this, then I see a blank stare in the audience. Now, is this all he has to say? Where, is, where are the clear-cut solutions for our solutions? Where's revolution? So this man comes here and says, well, we should talk to experts more. Now, <laughs> yes, uh, I'm afraid. Um, I, so I don't have the crystal ball, and I'm not a representative of a religious movement. Um, and, and so I thank you for taking up this, um, uh, th this misunderstanding that I created, of which I'm fully responsible of, of, put, of, of suggesting that we should all get, send our best boys and girls to Chicago and that they will save us. I do not think this. Okay, um, my name is Alfredo Atier. Uh, I have learned uh, a lot with your classes uh, during this week, and I thank you for it. Uh, but I thank you also because I think I become, uh, I became more dualistic and uh, a little bit more schizophrenic <laughs> as a practitioner of uh, law. Uh, well, well uh, there are a lot of things with, 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 which, I, with which I agree with you, and, and another that uh, 
are difficult to accept at this moment, of course, because I can change. <laughs> and my question is, uh, involves uh, exactly uh, the idea of changing. Uh, when you described human rights and the, uh, the approach uh, about uh, the relationship of uh, people in, 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 in the society, uh, I, I, uh, I, I don't know if I'm, I'm right, but uh, I understand that uh, you, you saw uh, rights only in a context of uh, a constant conflict. Uh, and uh, in your vision of human rights, there is no uh, room to consensus. Uh, it sounds a little bit uh, the uh, Hobbes point of view uh, when describing the state of nature uh, and the war of uh, everyone against everyone. But uh, in Rob's uh, conception, uh, there is also a place to a covenant when the belligerents uh, abandon arms and try to uh, cons uh, uh, constitute a society, a different society. When I uh, think about uh, rights, I think also about the American Revolution, when they decide to declare their uh, right to autonomy, and they uh, 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 begin a new kind of uh, regime, a republican, a, a modern republican regime. There, 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 uh, that uh, uh, didn't exist in modernity, because uh, the experience of modernity is ex experience of uh, monarchies and uh, aristocratic cities. Uh, when you uh, say uh, finito to your political approach, are you uh, also abandon uh, the idea of changing, the idea of or the possibility of uh, revolutionary uh, think, uh, revolutionary people that are trying to begin a regime that they cannot uh, understand at the beginning, and they are trying to, to build something new. That's my question. Wow, uh, <clears throat> but very good questions again. I have to say this, oh, the whole week I am just stunned by the way you are able to, to, to uh, find the weaknesses in things that I say and my own uncertainties and my own contradiction and, and so on. Um, so I take these two topos from the, the, the doors that you opened, one being the, the role of conflict and the role of consensus, and then second, uh, the issue of revolution. So, it's tr so uh, as my students from this week know, I think law is a vocabulary that's meant to be used in adversity. In a society of angels, no law would be needed. Law is needed only when there's conflict, we resolve conflict. But society, of course, is not just about conflict. And at the UN, where uh, in the 80s and early 90s, I was constantly in the General Assembly uh, representing my country. Uh, there, there, what I saw, in t how I saw international law and human rights law in the third committee of the General Assembly operate, this wasn't in the context of, uh, of a conflict, rather more in the context of a celebration. And, I, and that led me to think about the, the, the role of law slightly differently. So I think, so the world in which we live, surely, so Hobbes is wrong. So the world is not just what Hobbes describes it. But we professionally, we lawyers, sort of lean into presuming that if it now isn't, then tomorrow it will be. And what will we then do? And we must have to prepare for that. That's why our colleagues in the economic departments and in the uh, political departments of the various institutions, they think of us 
as the, the one who have a problem for every solution because we already see where this thing is heading and we're thinking that of the dispute that will arise tomorrow when everybody after signing the contract will wake up and have a headache and think, well, oh God, what did I sign? And so you go to the lawyer and how do I, how can I, so that is always in your mind. And, and, and my, so especially, well, many of my friends feel that I still, I lean into being a Hobbesian and that I see international world is as a, as a, a series of conflicts. But no, I see the international world as uh, a, a Nordic Christmas party uh, uh, or, uh, um, or a Swedish piece of cinema uh, that, well, describing the uh, Christmas party. Um, when I think about Jus Gorgens, Erga Omnes, about the international community, all that fantastic rhetoric, what I think about then is the Christmas party at the moment when all the family gathers and they come, some by train, some by plane, nearer and farer. Here's the daughter, there's the, the brother, mother. And we all come uh, around the Christmas tree and we start to decorate the Christmas tree. And we decorate it and this is the General Assembly, the third committee. Now we assign a declaration. It's a little bit used Gorgans over here, the international community over there. And we, keep, we hold each other by the hand and then we may even sing a Christmas carol. And there is a sense of solidarity. The law in w that we represent at those moments in big conferences, when we look at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, then we feel all that. And that is a part of the reality of the world, or the international world. But the Nordic, I mean, this is an Ingmar Bergman film. It can't be just that. So, so constantly when we are there, we remember, or we see that, well, there's noise from, a ki from the kitchen. And we hear that mom and dad are fighting against each other again. And we hear things such as, well, you burnt the turkey again, says father. And mother has the knife in her hand already saying, well, you drank too much also this Christmas. And we've been through enough numbers of Christmases that we know that uh, this will happen. And we think, oh God, here they go again. I will never ever come back. Next Christmas, I take my holy family and we go to Sao Paulo for holiday. <laughs> we, will, we will not come here because it's so predictable. And so when uh, Canchado Trindad or somebody else mentions the international community and universal humanity and all of that, then I remember the Christmas tree. And it's wonderful. And we are all there and we sing these songs and we feel solidarity. But then we can't just, we've been through this a sufficient number of times. The 20th century is there, we have to remember. And so it's not just decorating the Christmas tree. The kitchen is, uh, is there, the vodka bottle is open. We know what is going to happen. And then even in decorating the Christmas tree, we have to prepare as to what will come. We will come back next year also, although it's obvious that father drinks too much and the wrong aunt was invited and she just spoils everything just at the moment when we thought that we do love each other. But, and of course we love each other, but love is painful and the family is a painful and compl complicated experience. The international world is like that as well. I feel often that human rights people and the international community, universal, embrace people. They, they, understandably, psychologically it's so understandably, they, after every Christmas they erase that part of the brain which remembers when the knife came out and which remembers when Aunt Margareta and father started the, the struggle which they every year start. And so, I, so Hobbes, Yes, I, I'm, I have, I'm in sympathy with Hobbes, but I also see the limits of Hobbesianism. And I want there to be decoration of Christmas trees. Uh, but also, if, if I can use this parallel between Canchado and, and Hobbes, so we, we need to be sort of on both sides uh, at constantly aware. I have to say, this spoils some of the the Christmas tree decoration, because you're always, you cross your fingers in the back, uh, back of you. Uh, in the back because you're not holy there, because you're already thinking. Uh, and, but also, it makes you then able to go there before the, the turkey burns down and, uh, or before dad drinks the last bottle. You, you take it away already. And then you, okay, so you've been prepared. It's a kind of un, absence of spontaneity. And I, that's what I think in terms of critical law. So critical law 
So you can't be spontaneous and critical at the same time. By definition, the two things exclude each other. Either you're spontaneous and then you're pretty uncritical and embarrassed the next morning. Or then you're critical and <laughs> life is dull, but you know, you don't make those mistakes. Uh, uh, so um, people have, and because the international legal and the legal field is a field of like the, like the Nordic house, so we are often come together and we agree, but very, very often in academic fields, in faculties, we more or less secretly, we have our knives drawn and we hit at each other when, where it hurts most and when they least expect it. Um, so um, I want to, to build a sense in the academic community as well that, that, it, that it's a world, that's a life, that it's a complex life in which we have to be prepared for many kinds of uh, of experiences and in which the commitment, let me finish with this, in which the commitment to just thinking of the family as Christmas tree as, as dangerous or perhaps even more so than always waiting for the moment when you can run to the kitchen and take the knife from there. I think we are approaching the, the, the end of this meeting, but I would uh, take advantage of my position and uh, say that uh, we, uh, we want to take advantage of your presence here. So I, I want to rephrase my previous provocation. Uh, when you say law is a professional language, and I have read you saying that uh, we sometimes forget that law is a language in which the category or the convention or the illusion of validity, the notion of the valid law, is central to this language. And it is even more so central when time comes to try to decide with reference to law, right? So uh, when I was asking you about the regimes and their identity, their borders, we were talking, I was talking at least of uh, legal regimes as ensembles of rules, norms, and institutions. So I was thinking of legal or what we would call more generally regulatory regimes. But usually we think of the notion of validity as meaning also that the rule or the norm belongs to a legal system. When we identify regimes as sets or as meeting points for rules and institutions that belong either to several legal systems or to legal and non-legal systems, uh, the issue of belonging or of validity as meaning belonging to a legal system gets a little bit uh, more complicated. So uh, uh, I wanted to provoke you in this sense. Is still uh, the notion of validity essential to law? Uh, if it is, uh, does it still mean the uh, belonging to a legal system? And either way, uh, how do we deal with uh, legal regimes that are meeting points between rules coming from several systems? Some of them we would call valid law. Some of them we would say it's not law or it's not valid in the same sense as we understand law to be valid, right? This was the point I was, I was, I was trying to reach. Law is a professional language. Uh, it operates in an environment where there are other professional languages and in which the native language speakers of those professional languages grapple towards the same resources, struggle with each other, look for power, uh, engage with each other. Uh, there has been a habit among jurisprudence, um, uh, let's say habit among jurisprudence, uh, to look for the question, uh, to look for an answer to the question of the ultimate foundation of the law, the question of ultimate foundation. Now, from my perspective, the question of the ultimate foundation of the law is about as meaningful as the ultimate foundation of the Finnish language. Um, I, but the jurisprudence, when they have inquired on this question, they have found especially two kinds of answers that have made them uh, that have been inconvenient for them and for us lawyers. They are very famous and familiar answers. 
So they would say things such as the foundation, so uh, the ultimate foundation of the law lies in its eff effectiveness. Those rules are part of the system that are effective, e efficient. That's one famous answer which uh, tends to suggest that the basis of law is in sociology. Now, I've already said what I think of interdisciplinarity and those kinds of references, that the basis of, that the basis of my language or the, my uh, professional capability lies in sociology, eff efficiency, what actually takes place eff de facto. So that's an inconvenient answer. It's an answer that grounds the legal theory of legal realism, but it's inconvenient because it says that lawyers are not the best judges of what goes in as much as legal argument is concerned. Uh, there's, a, there's a second, slightly opposite answer to the question, which says that the, the basic foundation of law lies in the acceptability of the, of the rules or norms. Uh, and that tends to say that, well, actually, the basis of law is a moral question. And it's best decided by moral or political philosophers. What's acceptable? What's a good life? What's good in general? And now, I find that too unnecessary. I don't want to, to think that I, as a legal professional, am somehow would have to run to the moral philosophers, no, le no more than to sociologists, to find the ultimate basis of my uh, profession. So I think Hans Kelsen, when he was thinking about this matter, he shared this sense that, well, you don't have to run to other people to justify your presence. You are a nice guy and you're able to deal with what problems that are being put forward to you without any help of these other uh, disciplines. Moreover, if you think that uh, the ultimate foundation of what you do is actually a moral question or a sociological question, then in some relevant sense you become subordinate or a secondary to those disciplines. And I, for the life of me, could not accept being secondary to those disciplines. I am. I speak with lawyers, I can assess legal arguments, their, their, um, how they uh, operate much better than sociologists or moral philosophers. So Hans Kelsen, when he was thinking about it, he thought, well, let's say the ultimate foundation is neither a question of effectiveness nor a question of acceptability, but a question of validity. Uh, so, and that question neatly in a Luhmannian systemic circle points back to the law itself. So we, okay, so it's neither a sociological question nor a question of political theory or morality. Validity of law is an internal systemic um, property of the law itself. Now, you might want to ask me a further question. What do I mean by validity? And I say, I don't give a damn. It's a word, it's a word with which I can say to these people, that effectiveness has, it has various kinds of problems that legal realism has, that all of w w we are known. Legal realism is old hat. We can all shoot it down in five minutes. But the kind of idealism uh, represented by that other answer is equally old hat. We can shoot it down. We can, instead, we can be sort of ambiguous. We say validity and debate about what that means. So at least we can be assured that in that debate only lawyers will participate and that there will be no suggestion by anybody that we should be subordinate to some other discipline. So when I say and write and have written and will write that the questions of, uh, uh, that the fundamental questions of law are questions about legal validity, this is what I mean. That don't come here and tell me that my ultimate basis is here or there. I am here, I, I, these are the jobs that I'm being called upon to do, and I very often am successful in doing this. I'm able to persuade people. If I were to reimagine myself as a sociologist, ultimately, or a moral philosopher, ultimately, I would fail. Well, thank you very much, uh, Martin. Uh, thank you all for coming and for staying with us. I think we all agree it was a great opportunity and we have uh, all enjoyed it very much. We hope it will repeat itself since you have liked São Paulo. We would like to have you back uh, anytime. Thank you very much. Thank you.